What's up, everybody, and welcome into the Fordham Men's Basketball Recap, along with Chris Persiainen and, and Miles Grossman. I'm Colin Locker, and happy to be with you from our Rose Hill studios here in the Bronx. The Fordham's men's season is over, 13-20 and 20 overall record, bounced in the second round of the A-10 tournament. Their season ended at the hands of the VCU Rams. Guys, a lot to get into. Really excited to be here with you both. First of all, though, Miles, how are you doing today? Well, I mean, it was uh, it was quite the experience uh, being with this Fordham Ram team this year. Lots of highs, lots of lows. I think Keith Ergo and this entire staff would agree that there was this was an emotional roller coaster to some extent. You know, some low lows throughout the beginning of conference play, you know, unable to get that first home A-10 win for quite a while. And then, of course, that win over Davidson showed you a real peak for this team. I think, you know, year two of the key third era, if you zoom in, there were some disappointing moments. But if you zoom out a little bit, it does feel like this is a program trending in the right direction. You know, making day two at the Atlantic 10 tournament for the third straight year, something that Fordham really could not say just a few years ago. Chris, really happy to be with you as well on this fine March day. And Miles points out the fact that this was a Fordham team that competed valiantly towards the end, beat Davidson in a hell of a game, ultimately lost to VCU, but we were there along the way. What a journey it was. Colin, I mean, this team, and we'll touch on this a lot, um, I think Coach Ergo was honest about this team from the Wagner postgame press conference when he said, a couple of key things he said uh this team has a high ceiling we're not at that ceiling yet because it's an inexperienced team he didn't he wouldn't even say young he just said inexperienced said young and corrected himself to say (laughs) just not doesn't have a lot of college basketball experience um and i think miles made this point throughout the season on broadcasts that more often than not when it came down to it it was the guys with experience getting leaned on. Abdut Zambilla found himself in that starting lineup by the end of the year. Antrell Charlton and Kyle Rose both in that starting lineup by the end of the year. And once again, it was a young player with a complementary skill set who found their way in the starting lineup in the likes of Ramad Dean. Last year, it was Will Richardson. So you take a look at this team. I mean, they shot 31% from three on the season and 66% at the free throw line. It's indicative of a team that is talented but not enough to play the way they were playing and I, I i know we'll get into this with defensive woes and whatnot you know giving up 72 and a half points a game only scoring 70 and a half um but they out rebounded their opponents right actually by the end of the season fordham was out assisting their opponents by 0.5 per game so you take a look at the different margins and they had fewer turnovers per game than their opponents. This is a team that did eventually get to an identity that they could associate with. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't the identity they planned for themselves coming into the season, and I certainly don't think they planned for it to take as long as it did to get there. So as with any good college season or with any college season in general, Fordham's year started with non-conference play, and in my mind, The campaign dramatically shifted in terms of expectations from December 3rd to January 3rd. You could look at that period of play, which was really the bulk of their non-conference schedule, and say that it ultimately changed how fans and even perhaps how Coach Ergo assessed this team. And I look at some of the losses they took during that stretch, Miles, and you can't help but scratch your head. NJIT, of course. They beat North Texas at the Barclays Center, which felt like a momentum swing, but then they were embarrassed at Madison Square Garden by St. John's. They came back to Rose Hill, lost to Central Connecticut State University, beat Columbia. Then there was that opener, 2A-10 play, play, excuse me, against George Washington. But by then, it felt as though the damage had been done in one sense or another, and that this wasn't going to be a team that was going to be able to beat the opponents they were supposed to beat. Well, Fordham's been a team over the last few years that's sort of become known for a weak non-conference schedule. It's kind of in the the talk of the town coming into this year, and you got to give them credit that this year was simply not that. Even going back to the Virgin Islands, this is a group of really tough squads, and you know. There were some low lows in non-conference play. Central Connecticut sticks out, as you said. And, of course, you know, NJIT as well. Those are that 300-plus Ken Palm team losses. But 
they were tough. Those teams came in here and they competed and they were physical and you know what? They were better than their numbers said they were. That's just the fact of the matter. Fordham played one of their toughest non-conference schedules in a very long time and you got to give them credit to some extent because they gave themselves the opportunity to have a special record, a special case for a, a, a sort of NIT bid come the end of the year were they to have gone differently throughout non-conference play. But, you know, you bring up that stretch late December, early January, you know, coming off of St. John's, Central Connecticut was a real opportunity back home, Santa Palooza, if you remember. It was a pretty raucous crowd. There were people there, if you remember. And, of course, they lose. That was one of their toughest losses of the year, 82-80, to Central Connecticut at home, coming off of a very disappointing loss at the Garden. I think that's when sort of expectations did change and said maybe this is a developmental year for, for the Fordham Rams. But I think you can't really knock them in that they – had a much different go at non-conference play than we've been used to over the last few years. They played really physical teams almost consistently. Chris, before you jump in here, I just want to mention this. The fact that the non-conference was more competitive than it had been in years past would seem to have primed them better for A-10 play. I don't know if it did that, and I almost think that this team's confidence took a hit during the non-conference schedule. Colin, last year with the experience they had in the form of Quisenberry and more, the non-conference schedule was really what they needed to get their secret weapon behind their back, which is the infamous now, not famous anymore, mm-hmm. the infamous Rose Thrill crowd. And, you know, you talk about NJIT, Santa Palooza, you talk about Central Connecticut, a field trip day. Good, nice crowds for both, right? But the thing was that team last year – was 11 and 1 on the season and 11 and 0 at home and that's when yeah. fans started showing up. So this year Fordham books themselves the tougher non-con schedule and the the Fordham students decided they were too good to go see a 6 and 6 team <laughs> or a 5 and 5 team. It's just, uh, no, they're not like last and year. And I don't mean to cut you off Chris, but it's an interesting point that, you know, college basketball culture is is huge across America, but you know, kids just having a few beers on a weeknight and watching college basketball is not nearly as popular at Fordham University as opposed to other A-10 schools. I mean, St. Bonnie's, for example, nothing better to do on a Wednesday. Dayton, diehard fans. I mean, there's just not the same tradition of, hey, let's have some alcohol in our system and let's go to a college basketball game. That's a large part of the draw for a lot of these Atlantic 10 schools. That's a simple fact of the matter. This is what we bond over in college. In Fordham, it doesn't play that same role. And, and I think, you know, you have to go nearly undefeated just to get the fans in the building. It, it showed this year. Yeah, and so the point I was building up to is that, well, this year you have a Fordham team that kind I would argue – could have used that easier schedule this year just to see what works. Mm. But would anything have worked against an easier schedule? Would they have run into a wall come A-10 play? I do think it was smart to have the harder non-conference schedule, especially for this year's team that needed to be roughed around a little early on. And, you know, you can kind of then take a look at the end of non-conference, you know, the loss to St. John's. They get a revenge game, a chance to bounce back against CCSU. They lose by two at home. And then things kind of turn around for them because they beat Columbia, you know, not good in Ivy play, but that's okay. They beat GW in triple overtime on the road. There's a statement. There's your turning point. There's your inflection point. Mm -hmm. Something is going to happen from then on. And they respond by losing against LaSalle at home winning on the road at Bonnie's, losing at home on Latin night versus Davidson, losing at home to Loyola Chicago. Then they go to Rhode Island. They get one win, and they lose their next two against Duquesne and Richmond. It was one step forward, two steps backward throughout conference play until the Dayton and Davidson games on the road. I felt like those were the two most important losses of the season in regards to trying to figure out what the identity was that they needed to get back to. And you listen to the Keith Ergo show with our guy Andrew Bogish. Coach talked about how he got away from himself and his identity as a coach for a couple weeks in February. 
notably um, starting, you know, Will Richardson and, and Elijah Gray uh, was a change and putting Ramad Dean in the starting Prioritizing lineup. offense. Prioritizing offense, right? And that's what Ergo said his mistake was. Well, he was starting his, his good old starting lineup at St. Joseph's, and they they didn't score 70 points. Mm-hmm. Um, they allowed 82. So that, that, that team is a team that, you know, ripped through their A-10 play until they didn't. Uh, that whatever, right? But I think a big point was they go to UMass and you have starters telling the coach that certain players should get benched and that actually happening. Um, That's a point of the year where these experienced players are ready to cut through the crap and to say, all right, we got to give ourselves the best shot we have. This is how we're going to do it. It almost took the team coaching themselves up and, and, That's not to discredit the job the coaching staff did this year because when you take a look at the internal development of guys like Will Richardson over the course of this season, guys like Ramad Dean, who are now penciled in as everyday starters who who were playing 11 minutes a game to start the year and 11 minutes a game last year, well, that's development, right? Ramad is now someone they can count on next season to grow even more. That quick release he has, the defensive intensity he brings, he can switch pretty much one to four Mm -hmm. defensively. That's a real asset, right? But this is going to end up being a transitional year for the Fordham Rams. How will they make the most of it? Will they look at these fits like Ramad and say, okay, now we need to get these kind of players and we need to do this and we need to coach them in this kind of way? Or do they kind of let this year wash away because it wasn't what they wanted? That to me is now we're at another turning point. And you know, by prioritizing adding young talent, which you know Fordham has already – gotten two guys to sign on from this next class that both I think their shooting speaks for them um, and and the the rest of their game is is the bonus Uh, that catch to shoot mentality that the Rams have will will be executed by these two young additions Um, do you go get experienced transfers or do you say do you set yourself up for another transitional year of developing young talent and trying to bring them along to be able to fill bigger roles in the future in my mind, I think you have to take another transitional year because you tried to use that method last year and the year before, but you didn't really get that guy, with the exception of Khalid Moore, obviously, two seasons ago. So I think it would be wiser for them to take a step back. Regardless, though, both of you making excellent points about why this season went the way it did for Fordham, and you can't help but look at the home record, and both of you guys alluded to this. 6-11 and 11 at home, not acceptable for a team that had designs originally on winning the A-10. And even if Coach Ergo didn't have designs on winning the A-10, the fan base certainly did the way two years ago went for Fordham. So you have to be better at home than that. And Miles, I loved your point because it is very hard to get students in New York City with all the options here to go to a basketball game for a team that is not playing winning basketball. And St. Bonaventure, they don't have to worry about that because <laughs> there's no Broadway, there's no speakeasies, there's none of that. There's nothing going on in only in New York. Believe us, we were there. We can <laughs> we can confirm that based on our reporting seals. And Fordham suffered from their home record this year because there wasn't that vibe of, even if we lose on the road, we'll come back home, we'll get it right, we'll take our frustration mm-hmm. out on the opposing team, and the student fan base is going to love it, and they'll be behind us. That didn't exist this year and to Chris's point the fact that they were still making all of these adjustments deep into non-conference play reeks of a team that never really found that true offensive identity now on the defensive end you hear the coach speak from coach Ergo which is a little bit more than that it's a little bit more than coach speak it's about a philosophy but that only gets you so far the entire idea that if we play good enough defense eventually the offense will catch up It's a nice idea, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't always work that way. And the prime example of that was the George Washington game where they were making shots left and right. And if they weren't making shots left and right, they would have lost the game. That game would have never gone to a triple overtime if Fordham just couldn't score the basketball. If they played offense the way they had for the majority of the year in that game, it would have been another loss. And that's also where I want to open the floor to talking a little bit about Elijah Gray. Because he's entered the transfer portal now. It's worth talking about his play this year because his peak really was that first not first conference game against George Washington. He was excellent. 22 points, 6 of 10 from the field, 2 of 4 from range, 
five rebounds as well. It was one of those rare instances for him where he played well in every facet of the ball game. He played well on defense. He played well at all three levels on the offensive end. Had some moments where he showed an ability to play make miles. But ultimately, his minutes decreased throughout the course of the regular season, throughout the course of the A-10 season. He was never the same player after that. For whatever reason, he wasn't buying into what Fordham was trying to sell. And it made a difference because then, to get to Chris's point, they had to keep reshuffling something that they thought originally was working for them and was going to help them do well in the conference. Yeah, the Elijah Gray arc is is quite spectacular when you think about it. There was so much of a trend in the right direction for much of the year. You think about the beginning of conference play, hits the game winner at St. Louis. That's the turnaround 10-footer from the short corner. I was thinking it was on the road in St. Louis. And, you know, at that moment, it seemed like Elijah Gray, I genuinely had this thought at that moment, hey, Elijah Gray is trending so well that he might get a $200,000 NIL to go elsewhere. He was playing that well. He looked like the kind of starting four as a sophomore that can you, you can rely on for a double-double that can also you know get it inside, get it outside, Pass. move the rock. I mean, it's there was a moment where this guy looked like a Big East talent that we were going to lose to NIL money. That's literally my thought process midway through conference play. You look at the end of the year, two minutes at UMass, and hardly in the rotation for the postseason. It was pretty darn shocking to see. And what was the least shocking part is after he's com- almost completely removed from the rotation is that he hits the portal. Elijah Gray is an immensely talented player. There were some moments where it seemed like him and Keith Ergo had a special relationship one that they could really go back and forth throughout and grow together. That's the only reason that I guess it sort of surprises me that he hit the portal. But when you just straight look at the arc of the year, trending as an everyday starter, as a sophomore, into the NIL to go elsewhere category, back into the non-rotation area for the final couple games of the year, you don't see that arc. That just simply doesn't happen very often in college basketball. I think Elijah has some growth to do in terms of understanding defensive assignments and where his what his role is defensively but he he's finishing up his sophomore year and you know I just think you know at the end of the day you just don't see that that arc to a season very often I know Ergo has to be disappointed about this being the close of the gray chapter on Rose Hill I go back to that Wagner post game mm-hmm. press conference that game 1 post game And Keith Ergo talks about how Elijah Gray's biggest obstacle sometimes is what goes on between the ears of Elijah Gray. Um, And as he's sitting there saying, you know, what did he have tonight? Six rebounds? Fantastic. And Elijah goes, it was eight. They didn't count two. Keith's like, all right, we'll check the tape on that. He will know, right? Yeah, Yeah. it's it's just, (laughs) you know, you remember in pickup the kids who would finish a loss or a win or whatever and say, well, I had eight points, four assists and two rebounds today, so I, I played well. That That's not Fordham, and I think you saw Elijah grow out of that as the year went on, but his tenure as a starter lasted eight games, and in the final one, he played 24 minutes, he scored nine points, he was one of four from three, he turned the ball over four times. That's the end of his starting tenure. For the rest of the season, Duquesne, 15 There were some minutes. ugly turnovers. George there Mason, yeah. five minutes. At St. Joe's, 12 minutes, six points, right? At UMass, two minutes, the infamous pulling. Rhode Island, eight minutes, 0 of 2 from the floor. VCU, right? Final final game of the year, zero turnovers for him in 19 minutes. Three of five from the floor, one of three from three. You take a look at, at how he was rebounding the ball, one offensive, one defensive in 19 minutes. He was more of a perimeter player that day. Didn't have any assists, but he was the team's third highest scorer with eight points in their most important game of the year. Even after his last rights had been written, after his gravestone was <laughs> was complete, he was one of the most important players in that seven-point loss to VCU in a game where neither team led by more than seven at any point. That says something to me about his talent, about his ability, but it never manifested itself, and I think part of that is the fit on this team specifically Charlton, the Swiss Army Knife, 
you know, backup initiator, lead initiator throughout the course of the year. Rose, the lead scorer. Everyone had a role offensively. Elijah's role ended up being take the open shots. And so I, I have a perfect example. If you guys have been watching the A-10 for a couple of years, you know Obi Toppin won player of the year at Dayton doing what? Running the rim, dunking with two hands, passing out of the post. I th- I've said on a on 90.7 FM this season that the Fordham Rams men's basketball team is at their best when Elijah Gray is drawing two in the post and playmaking out of it. It never manifested itself for more than a half at a time, a game at a time at most. And you take a look at how the season ended. How fitting is it that, you know, Obi goes to the Knicks and his role is standing in, in the corner or on the wing and hoisting threes. How fitting is it that Elijah Gray has that same fate? But you take a look at why that happened. Neither guys were rebounding at a high level. Neither guys were defending at a high level. Neither guys long-term were entrusted to play the five. As a result, there are four that has to float on the perimeter and wait for an open three and take it. That's how three out of Elijah's five shots against VCU were from the arc. That's why the only shot he took against Davidson was from behind the arc. It's just fitting because when you are on a team, Thibodeau, Ergo, uh, (laughs) Frank Martin, Steve Clifford, you want to talk either level, right, where the priority is crashing the glass and playing tough, nasty physical basketball, and you're an offensive, multi-positional talent, these coaches don't really care to make you fit in if you can't cover your bases. So for Elijah Gray, he might go somewhere and succeed greatly. 14 points a night as a starter every day on an A-10 team. I can see it. But that team will need to get the most out of him defensively. And for whatever reason, that's not something that the the Fordham coaching staff was able to do with Elijah. And obviously both sides play a role. And in terms of interest, I know that it seems there's a good chance he does end up in the Atlantic 10. He's gotten some interest really across the country. You know, New Mexico, South Florida, but a lot of high-quality programs, mainly Loyola Chicago, George Washington, wouldn't be all UMass. that surprised. UMass, I mean, obviously I feel they're the under course, Frank Martin a little personally. bit. You know, Josh, that, that could Josh be a, Cohen's headed out. Exactly. So. Could, uh, but it, it seems pretty likely that he stays in the Atlantic 10, which would be amazing. And what a homecoming he'll get here at Rose Hill if fans do show up and remember how this season went. And, (laughs) of course, there was a couple of sophomores that greatly impacted the course of this year, and we're not going to dig into each of them in great detail, but Will Richardson, Ramad Dean, never really found the sort of consistency that could have taken Fordham over the top. The same can be said of Joshua Rivera and Elijah Gray. I do want to go more specifically into conference play. We talked about the opener against George Washington. The other game I want to highlight specifically is the Duquesne game on the road in Pittsburgh because to me, and I've said this on the air, I felt that that was the game that truly changed the Fordham season because it was the one time, with the exception of the St. Joe's game that came much later down the road, it was the one time where you could say to yourself, the wheels came off the bus entirely between the ears where nobody was playing like themselves. You could see that some of the team's leaders, Antrell Charlton and Kyle Rose, were playing with a level of frustration you didn't know existed within them. In that game, Kyle Rose, one of seven from the field, just three points. That was Fordham's leading score during conference play. For that to happen, you knew it had to be a bad day. Jake DeMichael walked all over them all game long. Antrell Charlton, just as bad for my money as Kyle Rose in that game. Two of eight from the field. Did make 6 of 8 free throws, 11 points total, but still not what you were hoping for. Elijah Gray, one of the lone bright spots in that Duquesne game, 19 points. But really, other than that, no one gave them much of anything to write home about from an intensity standpoint. Fordham got off to a great start against Duquesne. And as I said before, the wheels just came off the bus. Up until that point, they were 2-0, I believe, on the road. They had beaten George mm. Washington. They had beaten Bonaventure. Road Warrior mentality was a big theme at the time. That was the narrative, mm-hmm. that this was going to be a team that liked playing on the road because it was good for camaraderie. And the game against Duquesne dispelled that myth yep. and changed the course of the season because once you lose that game, you had to come back here to Rose Hill where the fan base was not showing up and you had to play a Richmond team that was pretty damn good, Miles. Jordan King. And, and you know, it's funny because... 
there were just a lot of there there were a lot of moments that told me how tough the Atlantic 10 is this year. I mean, when it comes to earning each and every single victory, Fordham has it really tough in this conference. The Atlantic 10 is made up of high majors and mid majors and some of those mid majors are towards the category of low majors and Fordham when you look at that spectrum, is towards the low major side. You can make the case Rhode Island is in that territory, arguably LaSalle. But when it comes to tradition of investment and tradition of continued support financially and in every other way, Fordham is at the bottom of the spectrum. You got squads like Dayton, St. Louis, even Duquesne, in terms of history of continued investment from alum and things like that history of continued success Fordham doesn't hang with with Duquesne and schools of that nature and you know zooming out a little bit on conference play I have to say I'm not terribly disappointed with how the Fordham Rams fared because each and every day you you play in the Atlantic 10 is a battle for the Fordham it's an uphill battle if you will just because you are the little man you are the underdog you, when we went to Dayton I, I know I've spoken about this before there was the Bud Light landing <laughs> a sponsored Bud Light landing in UD arena there was the Jersey Mike's pavilion if I'm not mistaken as well the whole culture <laughs> is is completely different you have sponsored sections of the arena you have I mean it, it's just it's completely different. And even in the case of Duquesne, going on the road there was a case of going into an environment that has a lot more investment. It was a dollar beer day or $3 beer Ball, day dollar or beer day. whatever it was. But, yeah. Chris, when I think about the conference schedule, the name that comes to mind is Kyle Rose because there were stretches offensively where he carried a Fordham team that badly needed him to step up. By the end of the year, he was averaging 10.8 points per game. Never was that narrative more true than the game against St. Joseph's, where it was an atrocious basketball game. But Fordham made it interesting, or I should say Kyle Rose, almost single-handedly, made it interesting. He had 31 points on the game. That was a season high. I believe that's a career high for him as well. Yep. 10 of 19 from the field, 7 of 11 from range. Kyle Rose put this team on his back at times offensively, hit a huge shot against St. Louis. Elijah Gray won them that game on a turnaround Jay from the mid-range, but there were other times where it was Kyle Rose and it was his show. I mean, we spoke all year on the broadcasts about how what, and this is not, you know, this is not supposed to be um, against Jafe Medor, but what you hoped he added to Fordham's lineup was from them to go to zero players to one player that can get two feet in the paint without a ball screen. I know that sounds simple. In the A-10, it's a ground and pound league. It's a rim protection league. That is not simple in the A-10. Um, you know, you, you Easier look, said than done. You look <laughs> in the NBA where there's such better spacing and guys that get paid $20 million a year cannot get two feet in the paint without a ball screen. They need the defense to be tilted. They need an initiator out there to draw two. And so for the Fordham Rams, you saw the importance of that when Medor would cross someone over and slither inside, hop step into the paint, and he's looking up at a 10-inch height difference with some backup big that swats his shot. It, it's that style of play that I think gave birth to Kyle Rowe's number one offensive option. I mean, this guy went from and D his first year to three and D his second year under Ergo mm -hmm. to this year lead shot creator. And, and that is not something we saw in non-conference play. If you remember, Jafe Medor, always the initiator, then coach gave Entral Charlton a shot. Entral Charlton comes to coach and says, coach, we know this team is at its best if Jafe is starting because if he's rolling, mm -hmm. we can all do what we need to do. He can tilt the floor for us. He can get into the paint without a screen. But as A-10 conference play went on, Medor lost that ability that he had against teams earlier in the season. He was averaging 19 points a game over a five-game stretch before he turned that ankle. 
I was about okay. I was gonna say he turned that ankle, and in my mind, he almost never got back to himself. The ankle injuries linger. It's one of those things. It's and Keith Thurgo said it. It's not that you get over the pain; it's that you get used to just playing with that nagging ankle. And at a certain point, there was a solid ten game stretch where Jaffe was simply not himself, and it was no accident that was coming off the ankle of Davidson. Yeah, and so when you take a look at what happened with Kyle. It was borderline and incredible when it comes to, well, this guy is going to get the ball with seven seconds left on the shot clock. Everyone knows he's shooting it. He's going to rip through, drive in, half spin, mm-hmm. send the defender right, spin back left, and hit a fading jumper. <laughs> with confidence. If, if I told you that Fordham <laughs> had a player that was doing that this season before the year, yeah. you might have said, oh, we got a leap from Elijah Gray. Oh, Jaffe must be crazy. Oh, Josh Rivera must have overhauled his shot from Lafayette. There's no indication that that would have been Kyle Rose. A star was born. A rose bloomed in this garden. (laughs) And when you take a look at where that led them, well, you can argue it led them nowhere, but I would say it's the only reason they lost to St. Joe's by any borderline respectable amount. It's the only reason they were in that game at UMass because even though Kyle had a 5 of 15 inefficient offensive day, his full court 94 foot defense kept them in that game. The leadership that him and Antrell brought to the table. If you guys notice, when Coach Ergo calls timeout, he takes a couple seconds to deliberate with Trey Woodall, Ronald Ramon, and Henry Lowe. Mm-hmm. Right? You know who leads the huddle in that time? It's Antrell Charlton every single time. He leads the huddle and he says, guys, we got to do this. You got to do this. Abdu. You're supposed to be dropping. We need that to happen. Like, he, he knows the schemes. He knows what the team's supposed to be doing. He stepped up as a leader, and you saw Kyle doing the same by the end of the season. This team found its identity. Scrappy, inexperienced, going to out-hustle you for 40 minutes, and if they score more points, so be it. Towards the end of the season, Antrell Charlton, Abdu Sambila, Kyle Rose really found their footing, in my estimation. Now, Charlton not from a scoring sense, but from the sense of playing like that true point guard that he originally was, without him facilitating towards the end of the season and into the A-10 tournament, Fordham would have been in a world of hurt, and Abdu Simbila struggled all year long. It was frustrating to watch at points when he will be back next season, or at least it appears that way. He was very good in the A-10 tournament. He took a beating in the A-10 tournament. Those three guys really kept Fordham's hopes, dreams, alive without them who knows where this season would have ended it likely would have ended against Davidson or some other team in the Atlantic 10 tournament at the Barclays Center so when you look at the senior core or the older core I should say they really did step up when Fordham needed them to step up now the results weren't what anyone thought they would be or at least not what I thought they would be towards the end of the year but it just goes to show that the culture that Fordham's trying to build is palpable. That's a real thing that can't be discounted. And with that, you have to look at this year from a macro perspective. I don't think it's fair to nitpick this season, drib and drab, even though it is what we're doing partially. (laughs) But after last year, this year was never going to be anyone's ideal situation because you lost Darius Kuzmer, you lost Khalid Moore. Anyone who had said Fordham should be the class of the A-10 was kidding themselves. That was never going to happen because you still needed younger players to grow. You needed freshman Jameer Tripp to grow, and he did grow. But that growth is continuous. That hasn't ended yet. You needed Will Richardson to come into his own. Now, he saw an increase in minutes. He saw a decrease in field goal percentage. He saw a decrease in three-point field goal percentage, and that was a product of seeing an increase in minutes and getting more responsibility put on his shoulders in terms of scoring the basketball. That was never going to be cured in just one season. So when you lose to a team like VCU, only by seven points, after having a lead at halftime and being able to go in the locker room and tell yourselves as a team, we have a chance to advance here, that's pretty good. Now, considering they were embarrassed by St. Joe's, embarrassed by St. John's, I think you take that as the outcome. Now, you would have liked it to have happened later in the A-10 tournament, but you lose to VCU you can kind of live with that at the end of the day. It's kind of like losing to Dayton or one of these other big schools in the A-10. VCU has been very good for quite some time now Mm -hmm. in the Atlantic 10. So shifting focus just a little bit here 
towards the bigger picture. Miles, I'll start with you. What did this year reaffirm about this Fordham program? And really more to the point, what myths, if any, did it dispel? Well, I guess it reaffirms the fact that the program is certainly trending in the right direction. I also think this year affirms the fact that Fordham, like I said earlier, plays the role of a lower mid-major in a conference like the Atlantic 10 that possesses high majors. And that's a, a difficult place to be. I think at the end of the day, Fordham, it's, it's going to take a lot in terms of getting financial support over the next few years. I mean, Ed Cole has touted the new era fund for a number of years now. And I think it's clear that he's well aware that if we're going to hang with the Daytons and the Slews and the yada, 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 year in and year out, we're going to have to compete with them in an NIL world. We're going to have to compete with them in a financial world. And, and, And that's not that easy for an institution like Fordham that is not used to having the tradition that is that alumni base that funds a program the way high majors in the Atlantic 10 are funded. But, you know, looking at this year, there were some really interesting arcs. As we we touched on the Elijah Gray arc, I think that's something that you don't see every day. You're talking a little bit about Will Richardson. Well, the guy was a 41.9 percenter from downtown in his freshman year. That was when he was on the back page of the Fordham scouting report that was loaded with Quisenberry and Khalid Moore. And, you know, now that he's on the front page of the scouting report, it's going to be different. Obviously, it's going to be an adjustment. He's a sophomore. Um, but it's, it's a program that's going to take a couple years to, to, to develop. And I think that, in general, it's going to take consistency – in terms of the off-court stuff, to even give him a chance at the on-court stuff. Let's assume for one moment, Jafay Medor, Will Richardson, Joshua Rivera, Jameer Tripp, let's assume they're all back. In my mind, mm. Chris, this Fordham team needs a wing that can flat out score the basketball. That, to me, should be their number one wish list priority. They need a wing that can score something similar, perhaps not the same, as what they got from Khalid Moore. Um... Yeah, I mean, if you can get someone... And Cleve Moore was old, too. <laughs> if you can get a Power 5 player on the bench who thinks they have a little more to show, who is from New York and wants to make a homecoming <laughs> to Ford, like, you laugh, but look Perhaps at, younger. It was a great circumstance. Look at Adams Wood and, and Charles Pride yeah. for, for St. Bonaventure. Those are two kids that grew up in Syracuse. They played at the University of Cincinnati and at Bryant. I thought your point was just how perfect the fit of Moore yes, was, right? but it's not that rare. Right, because you look at Mike Adams Woods and Charles Pride grew up in Syracuse. They go to Cincinnati and Bryant, bigger schools or Bryant, maybe not a, a bigger school, but you know, just whatever. It's a, a basketball school, and they say, "Hey, we've each got one year of eligibility left. Do you want to go home and start together and team up?" Mm-hmm. Hey, that worked out real nice. So for Bonaventure. They had pretty much all their production <laughs> come from those two guys, and then of course their own Chad Venning. Um, but th- that's uh, that's the thing is that when when you get to make those circumstances work, you have to. So for Fordham, they need to be looking for guys who they may not normally have access to. Like I don't know when when we're talking about WFUV sports and what to post on our TikTok account. I always come back to what can we offer that no one else can offer? The access to the professional sports teams, to the interviews with coaches and players. That's what we post on our account, right? What can Fordham offer? It's New York City, the opportunity to start, right? <laughs> like not playing for a D2 in NYU. The opportunity <laughs> to be your team. And, and so Fordham has done such a good job. Look at Jameer Tripp. Look at Josh Rivera. Look at Will Richardson. The perfect example is Ramad Dean of acquiring ancillary, complementary talent. You need a moon for all these stars to orbit around. And that is why, you know, to say Fordham needs a They a need wing. a guy. Fordham needs a wing that can score. Yeah, I need a, a, a low rent apartment in right. New York City and <laughs> but it's, free groceries. And I need that truth. too. You know, but exactly. But the thing is everyone wants it. And so as a result, that's why these NIL deals come into play. That's why Fordham, you know, has lost out on players that 
got hundreds of thousands of dollars from bigger schools to average under 10 points a game for the season. It, it's happened. And the reason is because at the end of the day, the money talks, but Fordham needs to find guys. And I think Ergo said this perfectly. If we're reaching out to someone to transfer to Fordham and their first response is, here's the contact of my NIL agent, Fordham's done there. Because they, they know not only are those not the guys they want to talk to, but those are the conversations they can't hang in. I think it's honest. I think it's honest. I think it's genuine. NIL aside, the other skill that I think Fordham needs to acquire, if they can't get the guy, ball handling. There's one, I was just going to say that. They need someone that can facilitate and handle the ball because if Jafé Madour does come back, let's assume he does, and has to be a shoot-first sort of player, you don't want him facilitating. You need someone else to play that pure point guard mm-hmm. role that Antrell Charlton was so good at down the stretch for Fordham Miles. If they can't get the guy, at the very least, they could get someone that can run point and then spread the ball around, spread the love around to the guys that may or may not be able to hit big shots when they matter. Yeah, the transfer portal is an uphill battle if you're the Fordham Rams. Like what you guys have sort of touched on, that they, they have to hang in a conference that has deep pockets. I mean, NIL-wise, Fordham has to kind of come up with the funds just to match the budgets of Dayton, St. Louis, yada, yada, yada. I mean, UMass, for example, has been very public about what they can do NIL-wise. You see their NIL collective on Twitter all the time. I mean, that's just not the kind of setup Fordham has at the moment. And, you know, it's going to be difficult to land to land talent. There's a lot of talent in the portal right now. I think it's true. A, a, a pass-first point guard that can handle a basketball would be nice. I know it, it just reminds me, uh, Iona, we're talking about, you know, how they can use New York as a piece to land guys. Iona landed a four-star. I was going to say. Right. Adam Nije, I think his name is. Bigger recruit than anyone they had in the Patino era. It's the, it's the highest point guard Tobin? recruit in, in program history. So it's like. You know, use that New York, try and keep the New York talent here. It's easier said than done, but obviously the idea of a, of, of a New York City point guard staying home at Fordham, is it, it sounds really nice in my mind. Um, obviously, they're, they're also going to look for some experience in the portal. I mean, some names that just come to mind off the bat. Cornell has two really talented guys in the portal, Chris Mannon, of course, as well as Isaiah Gray difficult lands if you're the Fordham Rams guys that are going to get attention from some legitimate high major low lower high majors is what I'd really say but they're going to have to have the deep pockets in the NIL transfer portal and I it I don't know if they do at the moment and I don't know if they're kind of willing to compete in that game um it, 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 the first thing like, I mean to wrap it up Man, it's just an uphill be battle. It's an uphill oh. battle. Deep pockets is not something that they possess at the moment, from as far as I know. Well, now you're going to get me to choke up here. I was going to have to say, Chris, Miles, final thoughts on the season and the future for Fordham basketball? Um, I think just really quickly about Chris Mann, and he would be the perfect Fordham mm-hmm. Ram. Coach Ergo would love him. Uh, just last week, Tim O'Toole, who we know well here at Fordham, flew in to recruit him to pit so i you know i think that shit may have sailed but uh, um i just think that the rams need to look for guys who are going to be underdogs like jafe Madur was the perfect attempt from them at bringing someone up to this next level that can hang and you take a look at the end of the season when he got to straight line drives kicking out easily from the paint didn't always make the right read it was the right offensive process. That's something you're going to get out of Jameer Tripp. That's something you're going to get out of Ramad Dean. That's something you're going to get out of Will Richardson. They're going to do the best they can within their abilities to have the right offensive process get a good shot. You never really see any of those guys just pull up from the mid-range because they can with 14 seconds left on the shot clock. This team is well-coached. This team will be well-coached. They have a coaching staff that is exponentially increasing its experience each year. Keith Ergo just doubled the amount of years he spent as a college basketball head coach this past season. And he'll be the first to tell you he learned a lot about what works and what doesn't. This is all great to talk about. Hope is very tasty. It's, it's, I want to say like Sour Patch Kids. Like you just can't, you got to, you reach in the bag for one more little dose of hope. And you can spin things and put them in whatever light. At the end of the day, the time to act is now. This is an integral off season for Fordham basketball. And, 
you take a look at the internal approach where Ergo has said in the, the end of your meetings that the players kind of all agreed that they want to have the most intense off-season workouts possible. They want to have the most intense onboarding And they want to get to it right now. They want to get. They don't want to break. They want to get to it. So it's amazing that the team is hungry. It's amazing mm. that these people want to achieve what they know they can. Um, because, you know, the motto this year, and if you remember Henry Lowe saying it along with me in one of our post-game interviews, well, Coach Ergo wants us to be the best team we can be by the end of the year. It, it it became like a nursery rhyme, you know, yes, like everyone's singing along. I know there's disagreement here, but I genuinely believe that given all of their circumstances, the Fordham team you saw come back in magnificent fashion against Davidson, mm -hmm. the Fordham team you saw lose to VCU by seven, that was the best team they were going to be. By the end of the year, I do believe that. And the reason I'm so firm on that is because everyone was playing their role the best they could. And whether guys could have been playing better is undebatable. They could have been playing better, but not in a role that worked for the team. And so you have to think if you're Fordham, how hard the job is to pick guys out, project how good they can be project what role they'll fill and develop into being able to fill and project how good they'll be at that role by the end of the season. It's like putting together a puzzle, but the pieces stay the same shape, but what's on them switches places throughout the year. And you're always like, ah, ah I thought I had that corner done, and now that's not even a corner piece. Uh -huh. uh, this, this cornerstone of my puzzle is in the middle now? Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> So it's really difficult, right? It's like you're blindfolded trying to play darts on a moving target. Sometimes you have to get lucky, and Khalid Moore just has to want to come up. <laughs> Sometimes you have to get lucky, and you get a COVID year for Quisenberry, who's able to stay a fifth year and bring the ceiling of the team up to what he was able to with his on-ball creation. But the way to get lucky is to be prepared and ready and putting yourself in the right situation. So for Fordham, they cannot play this cool. This needs to be the most aggressive offseason. Transfers, NIL, training, tape, workouts, right? I want guys' phones blowing up with DMAC telling them, you should have split the defense there. <laughs> you could have done, you had Abdu for a lob, you this and this, right? That's how it's got to be. Because when you put your all into being 1% better, mm -hmm. you'll get 1% better. If you just try to be the best team you can be, you will end up failing in so many different areas. And I think. By the end of the season, Fordham was like, no, we're focused on defense. The offense will come. We're all talented. We are focused on defense. And where did that get them? Got them from being a, a 12 seed in almost beating VCU in the second round. So that, to me, that's the best team they were going to be. They did it. Yeah. Now it's time to make that whatever that best is twice as good. Final thoughts from Mr. Grossman. I think, you know, that did become a bit of a nursery rhyme at the end of the year. Become the best team that we can be by the end of the year. And kind of the other half of that was, well, we'll like the results if we become the best team that we can be by the end of the year. Chris, I do, I do disagree with you. I don't think that they became the best team that they could be by the end of the year simply because the talent was truly there. I know it was inexperienced talent. But when you think about the path of this year, Keith Ergo talked about it on the Keith Ergo show with Andrew, as you said, Andrew Bogish. There was a time in February where the team and Keith Ergo sort of got away from their identity. And I think throughout that process, they sort of, in a way, lowered their ceiling. The Fordham Rams lost sight of who they were temporarily. Elijah Gray went from being this cornerstone as you said to becoming oh wait the cornerstone is not a cornerstone we can't we can't make this a cornerstone and they weren't able to kind of regain their path it was a team that had an immense amount of talent I think in a really tough conference you have to love the second half against Davidson the second half in overtime against Davidson was a perfect example of the ceiling of this team but that was just 25 minutes of basketball time and I, I don't think that we got enough of that product enough of that ceiling down the stretch to say this team reached exactly that their ceiling but I mean it, it's if you zoom in guys 
it's disappointing. If you zoom out, you say this is a Fordham Ram franchise now in the NIL world. It's safe to say franchise that is trending in the right direction. Second day at the A-10 tournament for the third straight year. Of course, it was the double by qualifier just last year. They had to claw their way to it and beat Davidson to survive on day two this year. But that kind of consistency, survived advance to day two, three straight years. Of course, it starts with Neptune, two years under Ergo, the new era fund with Ed Cole. You zoom out, you say, this was a step in the right direction. We're developing a true culture here with a consistent coaching staff that's going to bring in high-level talent, Atlantic 10 talent. That's a genuine takeaway. You zoom in, you say, this was not the ceiling. Ultimately, it could be a matter of perception and how you choose to look at this season of Fordham men's basketball. Regardless, though, guys, it was really fun talking about this year with you both. It was even more fun to go through this year with you both. That's going to do it for us from the Rose Hill Studios. For Miles Grossman and Chris Persianen, I'm Colin Lochran saying so long from the Bronx.